Hey, well, listen, the last five weeks we've been going through Philemon, and we've learned a lot of stuff from that little book. I'm sure a lot of you were amazed that we could spend that much time in yeah. Philemon. <laughs> but uh, uh, last week we finished it up, we wrapped up the book, and, and we saw the, the conclusion, and we, we uh, speculated a little bit on how that might have panned out, but uh, ultimately we know that for our own selves we have to make the choice either forgive or, um, or suffer the consequences for not forgiving. But, uh, you know, as we go through the Bible, uh, at various times, different topics come up. You know, we've been going through Mark in the evening services, and, and we, um, wow, it's really heavy on people this side of the congregation today. Anyway, and then the people on this side are all the way over on that side, yeah. but that's okay. But, uh, uh, you know, like when we went, we were going through Mark and we decided to, to discuss the topic of the flesh because we came across, you know, Jesus' temptation in the wilderness and we just discussed uh, the relationship of the flesh and, and, uh, and, and Jesus and our own experiences with the flesh. And it was really interesting to see that topic as it popped up and uh, when we go through Philemon, there is a topic that can kind of be, you know, it's not directly addressed, but, you know, it can be kind of in the back of our mind as we go through that book. And it's the topic of slavery. Slavery in the Bible. What does the Bible teach about slavery? Because today, you know, we have our own national history with slavery, and it's not very pretty. Uh, we had uh, chattel slavery, where we were enslaving uh, African and, uh, Africans and, you know, kidnapping them from their homes, transporting them across the ocean, forcing them to do labor that uh, the white people didn't want to do. And, and then we fought a whole war over it, and, and uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were killed uh, in the process of ridding our nation of a tragic sin. And, and so we have a lot of strong opinion on slavery, and most of us have been uh, taught and educated in our national history and have a negative viewpoint on, on slavery. It's evil. It's bad. We can't, you know, we're still suffering consequences from, from the results of that time period. And, uh, but then we read the Bible and sometimes we read about slavery and, and it's like it's accepted. You know, like it's no big deal. Uh, this is part of life. Uh, and that can kind of be foreign to our own culture, right? You know, our own perception, the way we've been raised up, how we've been educated to view history. Um, how does the Bible view slavery? How is slavery seen throughout the history uh, of the record of, of, you know, God's people? Uh, so to begin our study of slavery, which will be a brief study this morning, we're going to uh, address this topic in the Bible just so we know how to view it as we encounter it, as we study God's scriptures. Because sometimes we can force our own perspective on the Bible, right? Uh, we can, you know, the, what we, we've been told to think and feel and how we've been educated, we then impose it on the Bible and we can wonder why, you know, why did Paul send a slave back to his master? You know, <laughs> uh, that might to us be rather hard to digest. Um, but how does the Bible view slavery? Um, how should we see slavery when we read the Bible? So we're going to start our study in the Old Testament. Uh, but first, slavery is a human invention. Uh, God has a record of offering freedom for, from spiritual bondage uh, to everybody. And God has at times even uh, uh, gone out of his way to give physical freedom to his own people. And, and we know that, that God is, is not someone who binds us and restricts us um, uh, unnecessarily or, or you know, uh, to our own detriment. We know that God uh, wants to liberate us from many of the bondages that we do experience. Uh, slavery is a human invention. Um, and bondage is the natural result of sin. Uh, we, uh, we brought bondage into the world when we committed sin, Garden of Eden. Uh, bondage itself is not necessarily wrong. Sometimes God describes his people as being bound to him. But bondage sets the course of life for you, right? Uh, 
It restricts you. You can't leave these parameters. And, and uh, if you're bound to sin or if you're bound in physical slavery, you have uh, very little room to navigate life. It's, it's pretty much set for you. It's bound for you. Uh, you are restricted to one course. And, uh, and these negative, uh, bind, uh, the, the, the negative bondage is the natural result of sin. So slavery is a human invention, and, and it's a, a result of, of sin. Uh, it, um, but slavery in the Old Testament, it, well, slavery is a human invention, the natural result of living in a fallen world, but God's law did allow for the participation in slavery, although it did come with some very strong restrictions. When we look at the Old Testament, we look at the Mosaic law, uh, the law that uh, Moses received from God, we see that God had some very tight restrictions for a practice that he didn't institute uh, and that the people were already practicing unregulated, and God brings in regulation for this, this practice. Um, so, for instance, uh, an Israelite who bought a slave who was also an Israelite, there were some laws that they had to follow. Uh, first, an Israelite could not hold another Israelite as slave in perpetuity, meaning you couldn't buy a slave who was your brother and, and uh, hold him as a slave forever. Uh, if, you, if you bought... Uh, a slave who was of your same nationality, you could not just keep him as a slave forever. You had to uh, let him go after six years. So you could work him for six years, and on the seventh year, he would go free, and you would give him enough cattle, food, and wine to give him a fresh start. Uh, and if you guys want references, I've got them all here, but for the brevity, uh, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to list them all off for you. Um, come talk to me afterwards if you want these. Uh, but there was another law. Uh, an Israelite could not work an Israelite slave harder than he would work a hired servant. So if you bought uh, a, a slave who was an Israelite and you were an Israelite, essentially you bought yourself an employee for six years. Uh, and uh, you could not treat him harshly. You could not overwork him. Uh, and you had to let him go, and you had to give him a fresh start, so he wouldn't just result in it wouldn't result in him just ending up back in bondage again. So while these laws apply to a slave master relationship, where the slave and master are brothers, they're both Israelites. Um, laws regarding the ownership of heathen slaves were regulated too. Uh, heathen slaves could be owned in per perpetuity and were considered property and could be inherited by the next generation of masters. However, a master could not abuse his slaves. If a master caused permanent injury to his slave, like the blinding of an eye or the breaking of a tooth, he had to set his slave at liberty. Uh, uh, God frequently reminded the Israelites of their own slavery in Egypt and told them to remember their own slavery when they considered their dealings with their slaves. He says, remember that you were in bondage too in Egypt uh, so be kind to those who are in bondage to you. Uh, because, well, what? <laughs> the Israelites had it rough in Egypt, didn't they? Uh, they were abused, they were overworked, they were uh, killed at will, um, and, and uh, they were kept in tight bondage and oppressed. And God says, don't repeat the evils that have been done to you. Remember what has been done to you when you consider how you deal with others. But a, a master who killed a slave would be held accountable for his slave's death. If you found a runaway slave, you weren't allowed to return him to his master. And if you were caught kidnapping people and forcing them into slavery, you were to be executed. So it was, uh, there were some pretty tight restrictions uh, on slavery. Now, while there were some exceptions to this rule, these rules during times of war, generally speaking, according to these rules, you couldn't actively enslave anybody. Um, it had to be voluntary. They had to either sell themselves into slavery or they had to already be in slavery for you to actually uh, be allowed to purchase them. You could only, so, um, and people would sell themselves into slavery to pay their debts 
Um, and slaves who were Israelites were basically bound to work contracts, and you didn't have absolute power even over your heathen slaves. You still had to treat them like people. And, and um, they, uh, you were still held accountable for gross negligence or abuse. And if your slave thought the conditions were so bad that they ran away, people were, people were supposed to harbor them on their journey. Uh, you know, that's not the way we typically view slavery, you know, because that's not what our national history is. But this is what his, uh, slavery looked like in the Old Testament Jerusalem or Israelite world, or at least that's the way it was supposed to look like. They were not always obedient to the laws that they had been given. But this is, uh, these are the restrictions that God put on slavery uh, to keep it from reaching its worst realization. God did not create slavery. He did not institute slavery. Um, the Israelites were already practicing it. Uh, they, uh, they had it unregulated, and God brought it under control. And he put some parameters on it. It's like you can't go outside of these bounds uh, to keep slavery from reaching its worst potential. But now that we've looked at what the Bible has to say about slavery in the Old Testament, what does Bible have to, the Bible have to say about slavery in the New Testament? Uh, has, uh, does anything change? Well, in the New Testament, Paul, the apostle who spoke the most concerning the issue of slavery, taught that slaves ought to obey their masters as if they were serving the Lord. And he taught that slaves should not backtalk, embezzle, or be unfaithful to their masters, and that slaves should respect their masters. Even if their masters were fellow believers, they should be willing uh, not to make it a point of contention. They were to serve their masters with brotherly love, knowing that they were part of the Christian community. This was their... Uh, the, Slaves were to look at their slavery as an opportunity to minister. Paul also taught that masters should treat their slaves fairly, that in the Christian community, the world's social distinctions like slave and master don't mean anything, and that while uh, Christian slaves should not let their slavery bother them, and they should uh, look at their slavery as a God-given ministry to their master, if they could find a way to be free instead, they were supposed to look for that opportunity. They were supposed to look for a way to become free, to better serve the Lord through their freedom. Paul also grouped slavers, people who force other people into slavery, with murderers, adulterers, and other lawbreakers. So that opinion had not changed at all. <laughs> but, uh, um, uh, but we see, you know, we see the Old Testament, slavery is brought under control and made slightly more humane. In the New Testament, uh, Paul is not, uh, does not seem to encourage the abolition of slavery, uh, but rather to look at slavery as an opportunity to minister. This is the condition that God has called you under. Uh, use it for his ministry and his glory. Uh, but God's teachings, in the, you know, God's teachings and laws have allowed for slavery, but not to the level of harshness as it was practiced by Israel's neighbors or by Rome in later centuries or even by America during the antebellum years, but nevertheless, it was still slavery. This was still one human being owning another human being and stripping them of rights that we might think uh, are inalienable and, and um, uh, you know, endowed upon us by our creator, right? That's in our own, uh, uh, is that the Constitution or the Declaration? I get it confused sometimes. But either way, yeah, Constitution. Sometimes we wonder why God didn't outright, out, outright ban some of these hurtful practices like slavery. Why didn't God just ban slavery? Well, uh, there are some other hurtful practices that God also didn't ban. Uh, for instance, another hurtful practice that God didn't ban outright was polygamy. The Bible does not ban polygamy outright for all people, but it also, nevertheless, uh, it never speaks of polygamy in a positive light. Um, it, it, God allowed for polygamy uh, as long as the husband would support his new wife at the same level as his current wives. Uh, that's in the Old Testament uh, law. In other words, you know, you couldn't have a wife, another wife, if you couldn't properly take care of her. Uh, however, kings and priests were not supposed to multiply to themselves wives. Uh, um, 
And in the New Testament, pastors and deacons are supposed to be husbands of one wife. So at all times, God has maintained that those who are in positions of spiritual leadership and influence should not practice polygamy. Uh, it was a bad example. Uh, you know, it was not the way God uh, wanted things to happen. Uh, you know, Jesus was pretty clear in Matthew 19 that, that uh, you know, uh, God intended for marriage to be between a male and a female, you know, one man and one woman. And, and uh, um, you know, it was not God's intention that people practice polygamy. That was another human invention, just like slavery. And yet God doesn't outright ban it. He just seems to restrict it. But we know it's a, a, a negative uh, thing. It's a hurtful practice. The, the, few, the, you know, the people that we do see in the Old Testament who practice polygamy always end up hurting for it. Think of Abraham. Uh, you know, if he had um, practiced, you know, having only one wife, he would not have had Ishmael. Uh, and if he had stuck with it after Sarah had passed away, uh, there wouldn't have been so many other nations that later would be uh, a thorn in the side for Israel. Because if you look at his other descendants, all of them became problems for Israel later on. Uh, if you look at Jacob, Jacob had two wives and two concubines, and that just made a mess of everything to the point where uh, all these brothers hated the one favorite brother and sold him into slavery. And, and Jacob spent years just totally heartbroken over the, the, the death of his son, as he was told it, and, and then, you know, shocked to find out that he wasn't actually dead. You know, that was a lot of heartache for nothing. Uh, uh, David, if he had just stuck with one wife, uh, wouldn't have had so many sons who tried to overthrow him in the end. Uh, if uh, Solomon had just stuck with one wife, uh, he wouldn't have, uh, you know, walked away from the faith the way he did uh, and ended up, you know, splitting and dividing the kingdom. Um, so polygamy, it brings its own judgment on the heads of those who practice it. And God is very clear that he intended the plan for marriage to be one man and one woman. But he, he did allow for the practice, even though he opposed it. Uh, he didn't let it go without regulation. He kept it from seeing its worst form, but, but uh, he still allowed for it. And a, a third hurtful practice that God was content to regulate and not ban was divorce. Uh, the fact that God has allowed his people to practice divorce, even though it's never been part of his plan, uh, it was only allowed for the hardness of a person's heart, um, but, you know, the Bible was very clear in Malachi 2.16 that God hates divorce. Um, and Jesus made it clear in Matthew 19 that that's not the way things are supposed to be. Uh, you got a lot of gall if you're going to undo what God has, has put together. <laughs> uh, um, but the fact is, um, God allowed it to happen. He allowed his people to practice it. And so we look at these things. They're all hurtful things. They're not good things. They're things that God is even opposed to, and yet he allowed his people to practice it. Why? Why, does, uh, why, why, why doesn't uh, God just outright ban them? Um, but don't let God's regulation of an activity deceive you into thinking that he approves of it. God does not approve of polygamy. God does not approve of divorce. God does not approve of slavery. And a slavery in the Old Testament did see an end. Um, the first attempt to abolish slavery happened with the uh, prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah told the people, God wants you to let your slaves go. And, and so the people freed their slaves. And wow, it looked like things were great. And then they went and enslaved the same people right back again. <laughs> and you're like, wow, how did, you know, they obeyed. But then they undid their obeying. And as a consequence, um, God uh, sent war and disease and famine into the land because they were unwilling to end slavery. Uh, slavery eventually was abolished in Israel under the leadership of God's man, Nehemiah. Uh, Nehemiah was given the governorship of Judea. And, and when he arrived, he found that the people were oppressed by their own aristocracy. All the poor people were owned by all the rich people. 
and, and these were Israelites. You know, they weren't, uh, they weren't even supposed to keep this beyond six years, and then they were supposed to give everybody a fresh start. But they were just, you know, uh, you know keeping people in perpetual bondage. And it was oppressive, and, and the nation was unable to flourish because of this bondage. And Nehemiah put an end to the practice by calling all the rich people together, setting an example by himself releasing all those who owed him a debt and asking them to do the same thing. And the, the people released uh, their slaves, and as far as we know, that was the end of slavery in Israel. Um, but slavery had brought its own punishment with it. Uh, it wasn't until the abolition of slavery that, that they could actually prosper as a nation. In the New Testament, Paul's teachings planted seeds that would eventually lead to the abolition of slavery. Paul taught equality in the church between slaves and, the, uh, and those who were their masters. Uh, this would have been a revolutionary idea uh, uh, that a slave could uh, at least one place in society, have one place in society where he could stand on equal footing with his master or even be uh, uh, more important. <laughs> uh, um, it, it was, you know, this was never heard of before. Uh, and Paul, uh, you know, he, he, his teachings sowed the seeds for understanding equality and humanity uh, uh, between uh, classes. Uh, and uh, Paul even began sowing the idea that slaves were our brothers, not just in Christ, but in the flesh. Uh, Paul said in Philemon uh, verses 15 and 16, which we've read already, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever, not now as a slave, but above a slave, a brother beloved, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Uh, Paul saying, this guy is a fellow human being just like you, he is your brother in the flesh as well as in the spirit. It's not just because he's a member of the church. It's because he is a human being. <laughs> um, he doesn't come out uh, outright and tell Philemon to free Onesimus, but we see kind of an undertone throughout the book, uh, sort of a hinting towards that. If he owes you anything, I'll pay it. I know you'll do more than, than what I'm asking you to do. Um, and tradition tells us that Philemon did uh, emancipate Onesimus. Um, but, uh, you know, Paul, he doesn't outright preach against slavery, but his teachings planted seeds for its eventual abolition. Uh, um, so, you know, God did not approve of slavery, even though he allowed it to be practiced, even though he allowed it to exist, even though he didn't uh, ban it outright. But still, why did God allow his people to practice it? I mean, it seems like we keep avoiding the answer to this question, because uh, I keep asking it to you, and we haven't answered it yet. But the fact is, we don't really know why. God doesn't tell us uh, why he allowed his people to practice slavery any more than why uh, he allowed divorce or polygamy, even though he didn't like it and doesn't approve of it and doesn't think you should be participating in it. Um, but he still uh, is content to just simply regulate it. Why? Why? Well, he doesn't tell us. But here's some possible ideas. Um, God may have allowed the practice of slavery to keep us mindful of the slavery that we all experience. Uh, the fact is, we all experience slavery from the time that we're born. We are born into a slavery to sin. We're born into slavery to, to evil, to sin, to unrighteousness. We couldn't do righteousness if we wanted to. Uh, it was, it, it's just, you know, uh, a bondage that we're born into. We're born into slavery. Uh, uh, but, uh, and I think we realize that, we know that, but uh, if, if we live in freedom and luxury in, in this physical world, we might forget that slavery exists still. Uh, we might not have, if God had uh, abolished slavery early on, we might not realize, we might not have this picture that God wanted to use to show us our own bondage to sin. And we know that God has allowed evils to happen to bring about good. Like with, uh, when 
with Philemon, uh, we, we discussed how Paul, he tries to make Philemon aware of God's perspective. He says, maybe Onesimus ran away uh, so he could get saved and come back and be with you forever as a brother. Um, uh, you know, this, this evil that you went through, this horrible experience of, of uh, someone that you invested in and somebody who you trusted uh, stealing from you and running away, um, uh, it may, you know, may, God may have allowed that horrible experience that you went through uh, to, to uh, bring about a, a greater understanding, uh, uh, to bring about somebody's salvation, to bring about a better situation. God may have allowed slavery to continue to exist because he wanted it to be there for us, to show us, to remind us of our own slavery uh, uh, that we need liberation from. Um, slavery is not something limited to one dimension. All of us have experienced slavery on a spiritual level. And Paul described the unsaved life uh, as slavery to the law and sin, something that we couldn't beat. Uh, we, we, we talked earlier how bondage restricts you and puts you on a course that, that you cannot veer from. And the course of slavery to sin puts us on a course to hell that we can't veer from until we are emancipated from it. And if we don't understand that, we're not going to see our need to be free from sin. God may have also allowed slavery to give us an example of one aspect of our relationship with him. While God calls us his children... Uh, in, in some portions of the scripture, we're also called as slaves. <laughs> um, we're said to be slaves to God and slaves to righteousness. And while slavery doesn't perfectly describe our relationship to God and righteousness, it helps us understand the aspect of we need to yield our will to this authority over us. We need to let uh, God and we need to let righteousness set the course for our lives, just like slavery sets the course for your life um, our slavery is to, to God and to righteousness, and we're supposed to let those things set the course of our life and determine the direction we go. And also, God may have allowed slavery to keep some believers from getting too caught up with the things of this world. Uh, the fact of the matter is, um, we easily get distracted when we have physical liberty and freedom. Uh, uh, we know that in countries where Christ Christianity is persecuted the most, where there's the least amount of freedom uh, to be a Christian, uh, Christianity seems to flourish the most because you're, you're, you don't have much to look forward to in this life, and so you are focused on the spiritual things that really matter. And, and um, slaves have historically been the most open to the gospel because it offers them freedom and equality that they couldn't possibly get anywhere else. Uh, God offers freedom from that uh, spiritual slavery, which is worse than any sort of physical slavery because it sets your course for eternity, whereas physical slavery only sets your course for this lifetime. And, and perhaps some people would never have come to know the Lord uh, if they had not been slaves, if they had not experienced hardships in this life that made them think more about the next, if they hadn't uh, had a physical slavery to remind them of their spiritual slavery and show them their need for freedom on another level as well. Um, God does not approve of slavery, and we have a need to be free. Uh, we were designed to have equality and God uh, ultimately plans for all bondage to be abolished and wants as many people to find freedom as possible. Um, but in the meantime, he has allowed bondage to continue in physical forms to remind us of the spiritual bondage which still exists and to keep us from becoming too satisfied with the physical freedom uh, to the point where we might not do anything about our need for spiritual freedom. Uh, God doesn't want you to satiate your need for freedom with the temporal freedoms of the, that this world has to offer when what you truly need is eternal spiritual freedom that only he can offer. And so God has 
allowed slavery to exist, uh, to be practiced, to remind us of the spiritual reality that we might not otherwise be perfectly aware of. If, uh, if you're here and you're, if you're experiencing some sort of bondage, um, God has freedom for you. Uh, God has freedom he wants to offer you. And, and while some of the physical restrictions that we experience in this life we might not be able to do anything about, God can do something about those spiritual bondages that, that he is making you aware of. Let's pray. Father, uh, we know that there are some difficult and controversial and, and strange topics in your word. Um, help us to not be afraid to face them or confront them or look at them uh, the way that you want us to look at them. Uh, help us to understand slavery, Lord, not just physical bondage, but spiritual bondage as well. Help us to be aware of where we might be in bondage um, uh, inappropriately and, and look for the freedom that only you can give. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.